Hey everybody, Eric Grenier here with Philippe J. Fournier in this week's episode of The Numbers. Uh, Philip, we have lots of numbers this week. Oh my week. God, we really do. Federal, Alberta, British Columbia, Quebec, Saskatchewan. Let's get right into it. Where do you want to start? Well, we usually start with the, the federal numbers, so we should probably do that. We haven't actually, that's probably the one where we have the, the least to talk about, maybe, yeah. but... Uh, We'll do our, our usual update on the Nanos numbers, which come out every week, of course. It was 39 for the Conservatives, 25 for the Liberals, 20 for the NDP, 8 for the Bloc, which made me think there must have been a good number at the provincial level. Yep, um, it was. All right, well, there you go. <laughs> well, I'm sure there was lots of Liberals who were very happy to see that the gap was down to 15, 14 points, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm well, it, not it, sure it's, if this is what the re- new reality. We focus, we, well, we, we look at the nanos every week without, and we have to remind ourselves sometimes that it's, it's 250 people that were, that were added on. So I guess that they added a good week for the liberal and subtracted a really good week for the conservatives because this mm-hmm. is a big swing. Uh, it was 20 points last week, right? Yeah. And now it's 14. So, uh, okay. So are we ready to say liberal momentum? <laughs> <laughs> and we're both laughing. They're so back. <laughs> yeah. No, we'll um, pass on that. I mean, but I did want to. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, it's just that I, I, at some point you think a party hits its ceiling uh, mm. and a party hits its floor. I think right now we can agree that there's a, a soft ceiling around 40% for the conservative and maybe a soft floor at 24, 25% for the liberals because we haven't seen a. 21% for the Liberals. We haven't seen that. No. So we've. The, I think the lowest we saw was 23, and that was the lowest. So, you know, you take the average, you think that 24, 25, 26 would be the cruising speed, la vitesse de croisière for the Liberals right now. It doesn't mean it can. they cannot break this floor, but it seems to be the floor right now for the Liberals. So I think this is a, 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 a revert to the mean, right? A regression to the mean, we say in the statistics. I think it might just be poetic justice because I think last week I'd said that we haven't seen a poll with the conservatives at 39 or 38 recently, um, which made me say <laughs> like maybe they there were at go. 43 and, and, you know, with the margin of error go up and down. Yeah. Uh, so clearly I can I can predict the future by not predicting it. Uh, <laughs> before we move on to some of the other numbers that we saw, federal numbers that came out, I did want to talk a little bit about something that's happening over the last little while. And it's all about the carbon tax. Uh, mm, yeah. As we saw, it's happening this week. At the moment, I, I don't think the vote has happened yet, but uh, Pierre Poilier putting forward a non-confidence motion, calling for a carbon tax election. It's, of course, not going to pass because the bloc is not going to support it. The NDP is not going to support it. And, of course, the liberals are not going to vote non-confidence in their own government. Yeah. But carbon tax has become really a tricky issue for the liberals because we've seen Susan Holt in New Brunswick saying, you know, doesn't want to have an increase in the in in the tax. We see Andrew Fury, Newfoundland and Labrador do the same thing. Bonnie right. Crombie in Ontario saying uh, it's not going to be part of her plan if she becomes the premier. Uh, you know, with friends like these, I don't know if the liberals need enemies. Well, here's the thing. They, uh, those same people five years ago would have supported the liberal carbon tax. It's just that they, n- neither of them were in power. Well, Fury was in power, but... Uh, well, he wasn't, but the liberals were. Yeah, he wasn't. Yeah, the liberals were in power. power. It's just that uh, I think everything right now that the federal liberals touch uh, is just turning into uh, to uh, what's the term? The term uh, mush to <laughs> mush or uh, lead. I think we say ton au plan. But uh, if, the thing is, we have one side on the federal scene that is in a constant campaign, and lots of what I've seen online and is is kind of misleading, right? The carbon tax is a tax and rebate program. If you only focus on the rebate, you're misleading. If you only focus on the tax, you're misleading. And so they, 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 they say that the carbon tax increases the price of everything. Um, and yet when we look at serious people that get into this, the, these numbers, and that look at the granular stuff, you say, well, actually more people get more back. Uh, the big consumers of fossil fuels will pay more in carbon tax, but that's the whole point of a tax and rebate program. I don't want to defend it because I'm not sure it's good policy or good politics anymore. Um, And the word tax is always so loaded, especially 
for the voters of right well i mean the liberals called it carbon pricing right yeah yeah it's 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 just the 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 uh, thing is i i don't know i've heard the opinion that the liberals really failed on the communication side of things and i think that you can defend that opinion it's just that on the other side the conservatives mainly uh it's not like they explain it better. <laughs> they don't really tell the whole story, which, which makes a lot of people against it. Um, so, I mean, I remember that we had polling last year and it was asked, do you get more in rebates than you pay in yeah. carbon tax? And most people, especially in the prairies, like majorities in the prairies, said, no, we pour more in carbon tax. And that's just factually wrong. So that means that they believe they pay more, but they most don't. Uh, so... What do you what do you do when the population is is factually wrong? Uh, their impression matters, right? Uh, perception is reality, but um, I I don't know what to make of this. Uh, I uh, it, it's what do you, it is what do you a think? mess of communications, uh, and I don't not all problems are communications problems, and we shouldn't just call them that way. But I mean, it's a mess in terms of <clears throat> trying to explain this kind of policy. Because it has so many intangibles to it. It has a tax that people don't really know when they're paying because they don't. it's not on your receipt. Yeah. Um, you know, like whether someone paid the tax to fill up the truck to bring the thing to the store, that tax, you know, like it's, it's no one really knows exactly how much they're paying. And then they get the rebate uh, like once a quarter, I think it is. Yeah. And not everybody in the household gets it. Not everyone gets the same amounts, different amounts here and there. It's, it is a complicated policy to explain that the more you'll pay in tax, the more that you'll get back in money, um, that if the tax increases, which is what it's supposed to do, and which is why some of these premiers are, are going out against it, that the people will get more money, uh, which then goes into the, you know, the slippery slope kind of argument where if you increase the tax by a thousand percent, you'd start getting yeah. tons of money back. It, like it starts to become really hard to, to comprehend, I think, for a lot of people. And I think that's why you see for leaders like Fury and Holt and uh, who face elections relatively soon, yeah. Fury next year, though there's lots of rumors that he might go this year, and Crombie, who wants to make some headway with the uh, uh, in Ontario, that's just easier just to drop it because yeah. it's just not a political winner. Whether it's a policy winner, people can yeah. debate that. Yeah. But it's it's the the Liberals have lost this debate. It's yes, they, they have. they've lost that debate. Polling has consistently started to show that more people dislike the the notion of the carbon tax and all this kind of stuff. And so it just makes more sense to cut to cut bait for some of these leaders. Uh, but it doesn't seem like the federal liberals are going to do it. So, Well, they can't. I mean, they can't. It's too late maybe they, for them. They, would, they, they have to. Uh, it's the, the hill they'll die on. Uh, if Because reverting, like, like cancelling or cancelling the hike now would just look desperate and it would not help them one bit uh so hey here's here's a thought yeah justin trudeau goes on an offensive against susan holt and andrew fury do they come out better out of that <laughs> would it be a bad thing for susan holt if new brunswickers thought justin trudeau didn't want her to win <laughs> i that's a i'm not sure monsieur fury would would monsieur fury be hurt uh, liberals have pulled poorly but they always pull better in newfoundland than in hmm i i don't know that's a good question uh just it's, i mean if you're blaine higgs you're you're trying to say the justin trudeau susan holt liberals yeah uh hey there's there's a little way to knock maybe justin trudeau's think, doing this on purpose to help his a, provincial cousins but hang on though <laughs> thing is it's really not been the style of justin trudeau right no i mean it's true yeah. that the liberals in 2019 yeah they had before the pandemic they they did some campaigning against the ford name in ontario that's true they did that um but it's really not in their style i mean he, he if he wanted if the liberals wanted to be nasty in the next election they would campaign against daniel smith they would they would just I think they will. maybe they will but that's the nasty part that we that we have not seen as much in the at least in the true years um they didn't go against jason kenney in the last federal uh, because if you remember there was the uh <clears throat> there was in an outbreak in yeah. 2021 yeah there was an yeah. outbreak in alberta and kenney made an announcement i think it was about a week before the election and it didn't it didn't help the conservatives um 
anyway, it's just interesting to see that these provincial alliances, yeah. um, and in some cases, you know, in Atlantic Canada, the affiliations between the federal and the provincial liberals are real. They're not just theoretical. They're not just a name only. They're part of yeah. the same party. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, I just go back to it. The, there's not a lot of friends anymore at the, even the provincial level for the for the liberals, which suggests uh, it's the end. Yeah, people are, are seeing where the winds are blowing. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, I'm not sure how to do the segue. <laughs> Quebec number, was, we got I some was, numbers. Yeah, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't sure like, where it was okay. going. <laughs> I did want to talk about it because we have talked on the recent episodes how there have been some polls that had the liberals, the federal liberals at 21% support in Quebec. Yeah. We got a big sample Leger poll in Quebec and not seeing the same numbers. 27% for the Liberals, 21, am- 21 uh, amongst Francophones. But that's mm. not as low as other numbers have suggested of late. Um, Bloc Québécois at 30%, first, first among Francophones. But the Bloc Québécois has been first among Francophones in the past two elections since Blanchet took over uh, in, uh, in 2019. Uh, so uh, 23% for the Conservatives is not as high as we've seen, but it's still a pretty good number. I mean... We, mm. We're used to have the Conservatives around 16, 17, 18 percent in elections in Quebec. Uh, if they they do break the 20 percent mark, it's pretty good. It's just that we had seen, I mean, wasn't Leger that had 29 percent for the Conservatives like a month ago? So I yeah. guess it, it was sample size uh, fluctuations. This is a big sample of Quebec, so the margin of error is much lower. Um, and the Liberals... Holding on, I mean, it's t- this is still like seven points fewer than they had in the last election in Quebec. Um, so I, I PQ, uh, not PQ, sorry, Bloc Québécois gains for sure with those numbers. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, it, it tough time for incumbents in Quebec. Uh, both Trudeau and Legault are in trouble. Yeah, two numbers uh, to just want to pull out from the poll that I think are worth mentioning. One is the non-Francophone numbers. We'll get to it a little bit more in the mailbag, but uh, he had 43% for the Liberals, 30% for the Conservatives among non-Francophones in Quebec. And the numbers in the Quebec City area, where the Bloc Québécois was in first place, 37%, and the Conservatives were at 29 Yeah, that's Uh, it. I don't know if you know offhand, but the Conservatives, I think, got over 40 in the the Quebec City area in the last election. (laughs) Well, depending on how you take the cut, because, of course, uh, the outskirts of Quebec City, the Belle Chasse area, that's not really part of Quebec City. But, yeah, I mean, if you take the outskirts, it would get over 40%. Uh, The previous Leger poll had the Conservatives at 36 I mm. think this may be a statistical outlier, uh, unless we see more polling that says really the Bloc Québécois in first place in the uh, Quebec City region. Uh, but it's possible. It's just that it's a kind of unheard of. Um, the Conservatives, mm. we know they do well there, Gérard Deltel and all the others. Uh, this is their, the, 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 the base uh, for the Conservatives in Quebec. Uh, yeah, uh, very interesting stuff. We, uh, you mentioned the non-Francophones. 30% of non-Francophones in Quebec in favor of the Conservatives. That's high. It's only 13 mm-hmm. points below what the Liberals get, uh, which tells me that many non-Francophone Quebecers are also tired of Justin Trudeau Liberals. Yeah, maybe they're not so different than... Uh, they're not than, so different uh, from the rest, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that'll be something uh, to watch, because uh, there are going to be some seats where that could have an impact uh, in terms of who's going to win and that kind of thing. Um, you know, you look at a seat like Pontiac in the, in the Udaway, where there are a lot of Anglophones, yeah. where the yeah. Conservatives have won it in the past. That's right. Uh, That's and right. then, of course, some of those seats on the West Island. But we'll get to that uh, a little bit later in the if, mailbag. If I may, though, just before we uh, leave off the Léger poll, we're talking about the federal numbers here. Well, Léger mm-hmm. in the poll asked the referendum question. It's always interesting. And referendum, the, the support for uh, independence in Quebec has been mostly stable in Léger polls, 36% in this one. But the thing is, since the poll also asks for provincial and federal voting intentions, you could break down party support of sovereignty. A third of Quebec federal conservative voters are in favor of sovereignty. That's higher, well, it's, it's a tied with supporters of Quebec Solidaire. <laughs> <laughs> which mm-hmm. I I find He's fascinating. A sovereignist party, yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, the Venn diagrams of those two parties is probably two circles completely separated, but you can find a, a base of nationalist or sovereignist voters in those parties, which I think I find interesting. Does that suggest though that the bloc has votes to gain from the conservatives? 
Well, thing is, sovereignist conservatives, um, they like when the bloc is on the attack. They don't like when François Blanchet talks about uh, we are a social, socially democratic party, right? Social mm. democracy. So center left, moderate left. Uh, they don't like that too much. Uh, and so I, I think I think the Parti Québécois and the federal conservatives are kind of sharing a part of voters right now which is interesting. Uh, again, conservatives doing well in Quebec City. Right now, the Parti Québécois is doing super well in Quebec City, uh, provincially. Um, this is kind of strange, but I also uh, find out the Trudeau Ford voters to be strange. So that right. happens. Or also Edmonton, the hardcore provincial NDP in Edmonton, yet it's blue wall to wall almost uh, in Edmonton uh, federally. So some voters have provincially and federally different uh, behaviors. Okay, well, let's use that as a segue over to some Alberta numbers we saw. Um, right. We got polls from Leger, we got polls from Palastata. Uh, both of them showed, what, it was about a seven, eight point lead for yeah. the UCP over the NDP. So not too different from some of the other polls that we've seen. It's pretty consistent, actually, where things have been for the last little while. But it was the numbers about the NDP leadership race. So yeah. this race is coming to a close on June 22nd. There's six candidates in the running. Four of them are current MLAs. Um, uh, Kathleen Ganley, uh, Raki Pancholi, uh, Jody Callahue-Stonehouse, and Sarah Hoffman. There's Gil McGowan, former leader of the Alberta Federation of Labor, or the current leader. Current, and yeah. And Nah- Nahad Nenshi, the former mayor of Calgary. Some really interesting numbers there that suggest that he's got a lot of name recognition, and it does seem to boost the NDP's chances. Well, in the palace data poll, he actually asked for the horse race um, mm. with they tested the NDP uh, leadership candidates, which I find always interesting. We have to be careful, though, because testing hypotheticals is, is always hard. But the thing is, it wasn't even close, right? Uh, mm-hmm. All five other candidates, the non-Nanshi candidates, did not retain NDP vote as much as Nahid Nanshi. Uh, and by like nine, eight points. And so the NDP in Alberta, the provincial NDP, is also a coalition, right? They they siphoned all the support from other parties. And I think the interesting difference between the Leger poll and the Palace poll is that the Leger poll included the Alberta party in there, whereas the uh, Palace poll did mm. not. Uh, there's a I think there's a legitimate question. Do you include the Alberta party? It had 0.7% of the vote in the election, no seats. And it doesn't look like it will win seats in the near future. But thing is, the the when you compare, let's say, the, the Calgary numbers between the two parties, you see that the Alberta party eats up some of that NDP. The, the only difference between Palace and Leger is that the Alberta party is strong in Calgary, uh, which mm. so the NDP is a coalition, and it looks with the leadership members that only Nahi Nenshi can keep this coalition together. I think. We saw in the Leger poll, because the Leger poll didn't test any other candidates. It just had some questions about uh, Nenshi. And he did find that he made more Albertans more likely to vote for the NDP than less likely yeah. to vote for the NDP. Uh, and that was especially the case in Calgary. So the, the, his whole pitch, uh, not his whole pitch, but his whole proposition, I guess, to members is that he can win. And Calgary is where the NDP lost the last election. That's right. Uh, in the Palace poll, it did put... And then she led NDP in front in Calgary uh, yeah. by a few more points than the NDP actually won Calgary in the last election. Uh, so he does give them the best chance. He doesn't, necess- he doesn't necessarily win the no. election because he was no, still no. behind, yeah. uh, but he gets them a lot closer. I, the question is whether this is just because people know him, recognize his name, and these other candidates, they're not as well known. Uh, that's part of it, right? Because the undecideds were a lot higher with the other candidates. It was like yeah. 10 to 12%. That's right. And it was only 5% for Nenshi. So there was that chunk of undecideds that once they saw that Nenshi was on the ballot said, oh, okay, I know that guy. And then they could say how they were going to vote. So, but I guess the big question is, will members care about this, uh, right? That's a big question. Uh, will members care about winnability? Or yeah. about purity? It's It's been a debate for the NDP for ages uh, although the alberta ndp is a different animal um and they haven't s- had a leadership race that matters 
I don't know when. Decades <laughs> since, you know, Rachel Notley, which she won she in 2014. Won. Yeah. There was like a couple thousand people who voted and this party had, I think, four <laughs> seats. Yeah. Like, yeah, it was not a not a huge deal that the NDP was having a leadership race. But how many people are now going to sign up? How many people can then she sign up? Uh, and will the people that sign up, are they hardcore New Democrats? Or are they just hardcore anti UC peers? Yeah. Uh, there's still lots of stuff we don't know about how this race is going to shake out. We're going to learn a lot about that group of voters during the, this leadership race. And we mentioned name recognition uh, for a short race like this. Mm. Name recognition is such a big advantage because the unknown candidates and some of them are MLAs. It's just I'm not saying that they are they're nobodies. They're, they are not nobodies. It's just that they have little name recognition, even though they're MLAs. Four of them are MLAs. Um, you have three months <laughs> that, of course, if you become leader, you have three years to to, to yeah. you know to make yourself known. It's just it's so hard to win the leadership if you don't have this name recognition, especially with a party that works with one member, one vote. Right. Uh, you cannot just play on points. Um, we'll see. Uh, but uh, I, I think Nenshi has a I don't I'm not saying it's in a bag. It's just that he starts mm -hmm. with a big advantage at the starting line. Yeah, he's definitely the favorite. And he's got three months to uh, just, make himself the leader. You just jinxed, jinxed him, maybe. We'll see. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the numbers jinx. <laughs> uh, we'll move to a, a neighboring province, which has an election coming up in October, British Columbia. Uh, new poll from the Angus Reid Institute. 43% for the NDP, 22% for the BC Conservatives, 22% for the BC United, and 12% for the Greens. Did you have any big takeaways from this poll? Because it isn't that different from what we've no. seen in other surveys. But every day that we get closer to an election that things aren't changing uh, is a good day for David Eby. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And 43 is a bit lower than what would, he's used to. But seeing it, it, there's a bit of irony seeing that tie 22-22 yeah. between the two right of center parties um, with such numbers. I mean, we we were asked this in the Discord. How many seats that can the NDP win? Let's say they win all the splits. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they will crush like 95% of the seats, but it's not impossible either, right? If really the Conservatives and the Uniteds really are in the low 20s, both of them, the NDP could win 85 seats maybe out of mm -hmm. 93. And uh, it's so... He's looking at a at an easy re-election unless one of the two parties really starts to stand out. Uh, we'll follow the numbers over the next few months, but yeah, th there's there's no big change right now in BC compared to what we've seen in recent weeks. Uh, I think a clean sweep seems unlikely because the splits help the NDP in you know, the Lower Mainland in the Interior. It doesn't help them against the Greens. Uh, no. So the Greens can still win a seat or two, uh, and then you have some of the ridings, like the ones in the in the Peace River region in in like north uh, eastern British yeah. Columbia, that the Conservatives are probably going to be able to win that. So it, it doesn't seem likely they can pull off a McKenna sweep uh, <laughs> no. like he did in 1987. But he can like it is very possible that this all of the splits go the right way, and as you said, they end up with 85 seats and 93 out of 93. But it's also possible that the splits just don't work, right? That um, in certain regions, let's say part of the lower mainland, the BC United gets, is able to get 38, 39 for, yeah. in seats and they win. And then in the interior, uh, in the southern interior, in the northern interior, you have the conservatives that get the 38, 39, and then they're able to win. It could, it, like the projection, uh, you know, confidence intervals, I think, are going to be huge in British <laughs> Columbia once we get to the end of the campaign, if it remains like this. Yeah. If we don't see one of these parties uh, take off and and become the chief rival to the NDP, which could happen after a yeah. debate, right? It, uh, there's but always it, that possibility. It's getting late early uh, because yeah. we are now in March and suddenly we're, what, six months from the campaign? It's it's coming fast. Uh, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting campaign, not for maybe for the reasons that uh, Uniteds and Conservatives think. Um, because we saw the fundraising number that were out just what a few weeks ago, the, the conservatives really don't have as much money as uh, as yeah. the formerly liberals. So, but 
sometimes you don't need that much money if you have a good campaign. Uh, but I think the United's, even though their leader doesn't really doesn't happen to uh, appear to be popular among the electorate there, uh, they have more funds and perhaps the the old liberal machine can can help them get their vote up. But uh, to be followed. To be I did notice, I did notice that the uh, BC United continues their branding efforts. Have decided to adopt a bit more of a blue hue in some of their advertising. Oh, is that and, so? Huh? Uh, okay. And graphics. Yes, they've decided that. Just in case you didn't realize that our teal and and, and magenta, oh, magenta was you know yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> so anyway, the uh, the struggles continue there for BC United and Kevin Falcon. Uh, we'll see how that unfolds over the next little while. Another election coming up. In October, uh, Saskatchewan. Now, we talked a few weeks ago that in Citrix yeah. poll that had the NDP up, what, two points? Two points, yeah. And now we have a 12-point lead for the SAS party from the Angus Reid Institute. <sighs> I, I know it's it's hard to poll those provinces. And I'll, we have to, I mean, we cannot get into this polling without some context. In the 2020 election... The Saskatchewan polls all showed that the Sask party was going to win, but they all mm -hmm. missed the margin, right? They all, all of them, all of the, the, the polling uh, underestimated the Sask party support and overestimated the NDP. Now, I'm not sure what to make of the Insidrix poll because both of those polls cannot be true at the same time. Um, mm. They're taken at the same different times as possible. A month, it was a bad um, day or two for the uh, yeah. SAS party when Insitrix was in the in the field. It was coming at a time when there was teacher strikes and these kinds of stuff. But that's true. Yeah, but if you look at the uh, the regionals of Angus Reid, and I know it's it's small samples, but thing is they they fit what we think the narrative is that mm -hmm. the, the 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 SAS party is leading big time in the regions and. Uh, the NDP has an advantage in the two cities, Saskatoon and Regina. But the advantage in Saskatoon and Regina were not that great for the NDP. It's they, they need a sweep of the, both cities mm -hmm. and then some. I don't see a sweep here, neither cities. But I do see, see a green, you know, a Sask Party green sweep outside of the cities, except for maybe the two northern ridings. Uh, this looks very similar to uh to what we saw four years ago maybe not 48 seats but maybe the low 40s in seats for the sax party you need 31 to have a majority um yeah so also generational divide i mean uh, the approval for scott Moe that's was 57 yeah. percent among the higher uh, the, the the older voters Ooh, that's uh that will be tough to shake for the ndp you mentioned the, the polls underestimating the sas party last time when you look at the age breakdowns you really think that the NDP is going to have trouble matching the 38 because they were ahead by 16 points among those under the age of 35. But the SAS party was ahead by 25 over those among those over the age of 55. So yeah. the NDP isn't able to get their vote out uh, because their vote is primarily young. Then 38 is not is, is a high yeah. bar for them to meet. Right. So that's when if they do manage to get exactly this number, you know, I could easily see them winning 24, 25 seats because they are up by a decent margin, Regina, Saskatoon. Yeah. But if they drop back down to 35, 34, 33 because of the turnout, then yeah, they're going to, the SAS party can still win that 40 seats. So hmm. still a very steep mountain to climb. It is still going to be probably the most competitive election we've seen in Saskatchewan since 2003, maybe 2007. Wow. Yeah. Which uh, isn't saying much because they haven't been very competitive, but <laughs> it will. It, it, it will. This the, the, this set of numbers does not set us up for as much of a barn burner campaign as the ones we had from Insitrix. So, and now I'm looking forward to see what Insitrix has next time because yeah. they showed Insitrix over the summer and fall had shown a slow growth for the NDP, and it culminated in the the, the February poll, which had the NDP ahead by two points. Uh, it's, what do they show next time? Like it, this is a twelve-point lead for the Sask Party. Uh, there's there's no path to victory for the NDP with this. Uh, when the NDP was up by two points with the Scientrix, you could see, yeah, okay, a clean sweep, and then Moose Jaw. We talked about this, right, Prince mm -hmm. Albert. Um, but the the NDP has such a, a low ceiling that they have to win everywhere they're even remotely competitive to win the election. Uh, well, we'll close we with the for the for the numbers uh, 
portion of this uh, episode. Uh, we did have a poll from Quebec. Um, yeah. As we mentioned some of the federal numbers, we should mention at least the provincial numbers. 34% for the Parti Québécois, 22% for the Coalition Avenir Québec, 18% for Quebec Solidaire, 14 for the Liberals, 10 mm-hmm. for the Conservatives. Uh, your big takeaway? Plus 12 for the Parti Québécois, biggest lead yet, even though these numbers remain within the confidence intervals of the previous ones. But it's still an increase. Uh, big takeaway, plus 17 for the Parti Québécois among the Francophone majority. This is this would be a clear majority if it materializes, but there's no election for two years and a half. Uh, the Parti Québécois is peaking. Is it peaking too early? I'm not sure, but it's peaking. Uh, and uh, the Coalition Nier Québec, I will publish today, later today, uh, we're recording on Thursday, uh, my updated Quebec projection for l'actualité. It will show the uh, the Parti Québécois in majority territory and the CAQ struggling uh, to reach the um, official party status threshold. So, One of the interesting notes, just to go back to one of the things we were talking about with the federal numbers, is that in the Quebec City region, the Parti Québécois led with a big number. And one of the parties that was doing worse was the Quebec Conservatives. Yeah. So it either argues towards a move towards the sovereignist parties in Quebec City, which is also boosting the bloc, or it's that the, the this particular sample, sample had a yeah. few too few conservatives uh, because the provincial conservative party usually does about ten points better than what we saw in this poll. So, but, uh, <laughs> and and the sovereignty numbers. I have I grew up hmm. in Quebec City, and I know it changed since I moved out. But I have trouble thinking that Quebec City would be the most sovereign region in Quebec right now. Uh, so uh, support for sovereignty support for sovereignty was thirty four percent in Greater Montreal. 41% in Greater Quebec City, 37% in the regions. Uh, I know it's, yeah, so it might have been a bad subsample or a new trend. It's either. So we'll, we'll know in the next few weeks. All right. Got through the polls of the week. Let's move uh, to <laughs> some of the mailbag questions. Uh, so, of course, members of our Patreon can ask us the questions on Discord on Patreon, and they get the uh, episodes early on Thursdays and our bonus episodes every second week. Um, we'll start with the top, Ali Gersoy. How do you evaluate Justin Trudeau's quitting his job comments? Do you want to provide some context? Yes, so uh, Justin Trudeau was uh, with Alec Castonguay on a noon hour show uh, for Radio Canada, the radio show. And uh, Alec Castonguay is, you know, has experience. He's a great journalist. I worked with him for years. And he pressed Monsieur Trudeau near the end of his interviews, like, "Yeah, but the, your numbers are really good. Have you thought about leaving?" Uh, and you know, and Justin Trudeau basically said, I do not want to leave this fight behind, but I think about quitting this job every day uh, because it's it's huge sacrifice for my personal life and you know, my health and my kids. And, you know, this is something that is entirely reasonable to say. It's just that he's the prime minister. So if he says... If he's taken out of context that uh, he's thinking about quitting every day, yeah, some people are going to take that the wrong way. But in the context of the interview, it was just that, yeah, this this job is harsh. Uh, and of course, there was plat gate, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> when the, he said, uh, c'est super plat, and just anglophones that don't speak French or that don't understand, don't understand Quebecois French just Googled plat and they saw the translation was boring. It's like, oh, you're bored out of your job? <laughs> and obviously, no Francophone Quebecer heard that saying it's boring. It, it was like more... Uh, it's uh, ungrateful. It's an ungrateful job. It's a harsh job. But Platt did not mean boring here. It was a good end. It was it was feisty in that interview. Just thanks, Uh It, I mean, if he leaves before the election, this interview will come back because mm. he he was very forceful in his comments that no 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 he doesn't want to leave his legacy in bad hands. Uh, and he, I, I think, I, I really think that he means that he's going to come back. Obviously, it's not only his call. The caucus could yeah. revolt, but the caucus hasn't revolted yet. So I don't know. What did you make of it? I mean, am I, am I, est-ce que je suis dans le champ here? Or? No, no, I think that's, I think that's true. And I do think that he intends to run. And I think that it, if he doesn't end up running, it'll be because others kind of force his hand rather than him deciding to step aside. But I did find it interesting. Um, I do find it in general, he tends to be a bit more personal when he's speaking French, I find. Um, maybe it's just an idea of what kind of conversation is a bit more 
expected from the two languages. Uh, but it would have been hard to imagine him saying that in 2018 or even like 2019 or 2020 to say that I think about quitting every day. Yeah. But it's a really important job. And so that's, I find that in the context, that's, that's an interesting kind of comment to say, right? It's almost like he is trying to, trying to pass along the message that he understands that it's tough, that yeah. things aren't going that great, yeah. right? Because if things were, if he was at 45% of the polls, super popular, everything going well, he wouldn't say, I think of quitting every day because it's wouldn't a be, tough job. He, neither would he be asked all the time, or will you That's leave true. before the next yeah. election? I, I think he answered that question 25 times since the New Year. So yeah. perhaps it was also a reaction like, stop asking me if I quit, I won't. <laughs> yeah but uh, so it was it, a good interview so yeah yeah it got it has different elements to it right when you when you've been in the job for nine years uh it's natural to kind of be thinking about the future right so if he said no no i want to do this forever that would have been almost maybe worse than saying that you know like <laughs> i think about leaving it but i think it is revealing of kind of the pressures that he is under that he recognizes yeah. or at least he's trying to portray that he recognizes um that things aren't going as well as they could be we talked about caucus revolts. Yeah. So let's move on to this question from Gerard Kennedy on the Patreon. Yeah. Uh, so he, he, he had lots of different f scenarios. So let's see. But it is about the Mount Royal riding on the island of Montreal where Anthony Housefather is the MP. He was um, quite upset with uh, the vote that took place on the Gaza motion from the NDP. The Liberals brought in some amendments that really watered it down. Yeah. Uh, but even so, uh, House Father was was quite upset about some of the things he had heard during the debates. The fact that he 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 said afterwards that he was reflecting on whether he still fits within the party. And then on CTV's uh, power play, I guess it, it was with Vashi Capellas, he said that he wasn't ruling out going to the Conservatives. Now, whenever anybody says I'm not ruling out something, that doesn't necessarily mean they're ruling it in, but. He said he wasn't ruling out moving over to the Conservatives. So the question was whether Mount Royal uh, is a unique riding that national projections yeah. will simply not map onto. And then he said, just for fun, he said, what do you think will happen if Mr. House father runs as an independent uh, and the Conservatives decline to run a candidate? Don't think that's going to happen. That he runs as a Conservative, <laughs> uh, that he runs as an independent, and he doesn't run at all. And the Conservatives try to win the riding. So... Hmm. Could the Conservatives win on the West Island, depending on what Miss, uh, what Anthony Housefather does? I'll say this though: uh, these are this is an interesting question. But if Mister Housefather decides to, you know, rejoin and he he's, joins the the Liberal team and he stays there and he runs as a Liberal, he will win for sure, no question. It's whether he runs as a, as an Independent or as a Conservative. Now the question is, could he win? Um, I think Mr. Housefather is more popular than uh, the party in his writing. It's just that... He's former mayor of the borough, eh? Of, yeah, that's uh, right. Uh, uh, yeah. Amstead, uh, je crois que... Uh, yeah, so... Mm -hmm. um, or was it Amstead? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. I think it was Côte Saint-Luc, wasn't it? Oh, Côte Saint-Luc, that's, Côte that's right. Yeah, yeah, no, Côte, not Côte d'Ange, no. But anyway, uh, yeah. it's... <sighs> the thing is, running as a conservative crossing the floor, I mean, it's it's still a very good liberal seat. It's the mm. but the uh, Israel question is important. I looked at the uh, data from the census. It's the second largest Jewish population in Canada. The first being Thornhill. Uh, so, but it's still a relatively minority, right? It's not like it's, it's, it's a like 50%. twenty. I think it's twenty five thousand people. It's it's not a majority, mm -hmm. but it's a big chunk. It's just that could you assume that this chunk of people would all vote on a single issue maybe i do not know that and neither do our listeners or people unless you have polled locally um but i don't know what do, what do you think i mean it's the conservatives have talked about winning uh, mount royal since the harper mm. days or maybe maybe before but i remember in the harper days and they they failed um yeah if a father runs for the liberals in this writing he will win yeah, I think that's probably true, uh, because as you say, uh, like the, the the Jewish population in Mount Royal is significant, but you need more than than that to win the riding, right? So, will the other people that live in the riding 
lots mostly anglophones but um you know not not jewish uh, montrealers will they also see pierre poliev and the conservatives as a good option uh that i think is where it gets a bit trickier um we don't really know how uh, people voted within the riding, you know, what the base of support within yeah. the Jewish community already was for the conservatives. Um, so it's hard to make these kinds of assumptions. I think, though, that if Housefather decides to run as an independent, mm. then I think that's anybody could win that, right? Because I could yeah. easily imagine all three parties at 33%, uh, two parties plus an independent. Yeah. And if he runs as a conservative, I don't know, the, the, the Liberals won the seat by about 30, 33 points last time. Could yeah. he swing that much of the vote on his own? I think he could do it. I'm not sure. If, I'm not. I'm not convinced that he would. It would be strange though because he is not a conservative. <laughs> no, he's he's, he's right? like a long time kind of liberal, right? So so, uh, but also, I mean, Mr. Hausfather hinted that he could join the conservatives. Do the conservatives want him? I mean, that's the thing. I mean, if they if they feel that he they could have a seat in Montreal. I think they would be happy, but do they want Mr. Hausfather in? I'm not sure that question has been answered. Uh, but to, just mm. to go back to uh, Gerald's I think they question. Would, I think they would just to make trouble, but Well, continue. why not? And that's all. Trouble sometimes is a good strategy when you mm. want to uh, overcome uh, such odds. But to go back to the question of Jared, is it uh, a unique writing? The answer is yes. Uh, but mm -hmm. without local polling, there's not much we can do. Uh, we, we look at the demographics. We, we, we look at the past trends. It's true that the conservatives, uh, they had interesting numbers in that writing during the Harper years, uh, but they still didn't win it. Um, so it's also, and, to, and in 2011, it was one of the few that stayed liberal, right? I mean, yeah. The writings, the, the borders have changed, but that area stayed liberal in 2011. So if you're ready to follow... Uh, uh, Michael Ignatieff into battle. Uh, well, maybe you're really a liberal writing. So, <laughs> uh, Donald Clancy on Patreon, he asked us about the BC NDP uh, in their recent budget committed to running large deficits over the next three years. And he asked, does running deficits tend to reduce the popularity of, of provincial governments, governments in general in, 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 in the past? I think this is an interesting question because I think when you poll and you ask, should the budget be balanced? People will often say yes. Uh, do they think deficits is a, uh, are a good thing or a bad thing? They'll generally say they don't like them. But they also don't want austerity. They also don't want cuts, right? Yeah. So I don't think the question of a balanced budget is as important as what you're doing with it, I guess. We want balanced budget, budgets, low taxes, and tons of services. That's what we want. Yeah. Um, Someone can find the sweet spot, uh, <laughs> then they'd be good. I mean, if you run a deficit and you announce it prior and you say why it's going to be a deficit with a plan to return to uh, to balanced budgets, it can pass. Uh, but w just running deficits without a plan, I mean, people have to know why. I mean, if you're reinvesting in infrastructure, mm -hmm. you're reinvesting to something that will have benefits in the future. I mean, if my, you know, my local government says, all right, we're going to run a deficit, but we're going to have a new metro line in the city. I'll be like, yeah, sure. I mean, it's going to, it's going to pay for itself in a few years. Um, so tough question to answer, and I think it depends on the t the context. Yeah, it depends. I think it if, is a contextual kind of thing. Mr. Ibi is quite popular, so he could pull it off. But once you become unpopular, and that always happens at some point, uh, your deficit can come back and and uh, bite you in the behind. All right, and uh, we'll close on this one from uh, Avi Woodward Kellen. Uh, so this is more of a, a polling question. It says, what are the relative merits and demerits of various polling techniques, <laughs> rolling versus snapshot, online, automated versus human telephone? Uh, and he says, what is the gold standard that parties employ when they're flush with cash versus when they're struggling? That last point, I think, is actually an interesting part. Um, from what I've seen, parties that don't have a lot of money for polling tend to be okay using the national, the public polling that they see, right? They'll, they'll take yeah. that. They'll try to... When they have lots of money... When the conservatives, for example, or the liberals in the last couple of campaigns, they usually do have tracking polls done every day with callers yeah. rather than online. And the conservatives in particular will target particular regions. They won't bother with national polls. Same. They will target just the lower mainland or just uh, the GTA and yeah. track the numbers there. Uh, so when you have the money, that's kind of what's done because they don't, you know, the conservatives don't need to waste money to find out if they're going to win in Fort McMurray. Uh, <laughs> but 
Do you have any uh, thoughts on, on the question? Well, the, uh, the best pulling technique is without a doubt. Uh, if, if the price doesn't matter to you, it's live color. Uh, it's mm -hmm. what big parties with money do. Uh, live color and uh, with a good questionnaire. That no leading questions because you don't want to you don't want to be just flattered in your polls. You want to have the, the hard truth. Um, and uh, I mean, if you look at the example of uh, Janet Brown in, in Alberta, she she does live callers. Of course, we don't see most of her polls because they're for private clients, private clients that, that have money. Because that live caller, yeah, live callers. This is a very expensive polling method, and so. If that's what we're talking about, live caller, if you have a good questionnaire and uh, good staff on your board, uh, this is the best way. It's just that it's so expensive <laughs> mm -hmm. that you may accept to have the occasional IVR or online polls. Uh, online mm -hmm. polls are not that cheap either, uh, but um, because you, you need an infrastructure. I mean, the, the Leger panel uh, what it took years to build, and now it's, it's, it's among the best right there in the country. It's just that... It, Building a, a good panel, and it's not just building it; it's maintaining it over years because you know time, the electorate changes over time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, IVR polling kind of works to have uh, to be close to the green. You don't hit the pin, but you get close to the green. If I take a golf analogy, um, but uh, parties with money won't won't use IVR for sure. Generally, uh, it's one of those things where you can choose two or three. It can be good, fast, or cheap. You can have two of those, but you can't have all three. That's pretty good, actually. Yeah, okay. Mm. Okay, why don't we move to the quiz portion <sighs> of the episode? I believe you have won, because I think last week you were upset with my quiz. I think you lost it, eh? <laughs> I Is that what happened? I don't remember. Mm, uh... <laughs> I think you did. So, yeah, so I did, decided to not reinvent the wheel. The quiz this week, I will give you clues. I have four clues okay. per uh, political figure. Uh, and if you get it quick, you get more points. Every clue that I give you uh, takes a point away. So we start with four. And uh, in the French podcast, I tried to explain that you had one free guess and additional guests are, uh, are uh, forbidden. They won't be forbidden this time. They will just cost you a point. So similar to the okay. quiz that you gave me last week. Uh, okay. So I have three names here. I want you to get two, uh, but also in points. So uh, three times four is 12 points. But the thing is, the first clue is, I mean, it's so vague, like... <laughs> on purpose that I think it's unfair. So I'd like you to have uh, the half the points, so six points. Okay. Is there a theme to who these people are? Uh, political figures in uh, the country. So, okay. uh, so the thing is, I don't want to be, I mean, I will, I will say this. They all went at least for some time in provincial politics. All That's, right. That this doesn't help much, huh? Canadian politician anytime right. between now and is is there a recency to this? Or is there uh, after, uh, since the 1900s. <laughs> no 1800s, okay? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, let's start off. This person was born in Orilla, Ontario. I don't know where that is. Before entering Southwest. politics, this person served in war, World War I, where he was an officer with the Cinco Foresters. In 1918, after being wounded, he was discharged with the rank of captain. Captain? You have uh, one free guess, and if you guess wrong, I just take one more point. Uh, George Drew. Uh, no, so it's not George Drew, okay. although it's a good guess. Uh, but He you, did serve. You lost your uh, free, free, free guess. Okay. Once... I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my free guesses. I'm going to give it a All shot right. every time. <laughs> Once this person the... was elected to the provincial legislature in 1937, he went on a long political career and never lost an election. Uh, so he's from Aurelia. Oh, I would lose points now if I do a guess, eh? Yeah, that's right. That's why the free guess Thirty-seven. I will pass for now. Okay. Third clue. Now, for if you have it, you have two points. In the post-World War II years, he acted as the treasurer of Ontario. When Premier George Drew decided to hop into federal politics, 
he was chosen as leader of the progressive conservatives. It is Leslie Frost. And it is Leslie Frost. Very good for you. You get two points. Congratulations. I'm going to give you my fourth clue because I thought it was very funny. His last name is synonymous to uh, one of the famous Batman villain played by <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was Mr. Freeze, Mr. Leslie Frost. I thought mm -hmm. it was funny. So if you okay, had... <laughs> that's, that's not a Canadian political question, but yeah. <laughs> clue. All right, you got two points. Congrats. All, All right. right, okay. A good start. This politician was born in Kitimat, British Columbia, from Scottish immigrants who originated from Glasgow. This person graduated from the, from the college law of the University of Saskatchewan in the late 1980s. Uh, oh boy, born in British Columbia. Scottish, uh, but then went to Saskatchewan. Um, really no, going to no, use, no. use your free guess? No, 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 no. Okay, I'm save that one. Second clue. Throughout the 1990s, this person worked as a technical advisor on constitutional and legal reform issues in various parts of Africa for the Euro European Union, the Canadian government, and the government of Australia with a focus on human rights litigation and developing programs uh, with policy reform with respect to gender issues. Jeez, I have zero clue about who this could be. Uh, That's true that I have to say I'm reading it now. And this, this, I mean, unless you know right away, this is a tough clue, though. Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, Jeez, I don't know. Carla Beck. No, free I, mean, I know that's not true. Oh, okay. That's not good. <laughs> This person worked as a senior policy advisor to former Prime Minister Joe Clark, who at the time was the Secretary of State of External Affairs. She then went on to work for the Office of the Prime Minister of Canada from 88 to 90 under Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, before eventually moving to provincial politics. Jeez, uh, I... If you I guess no, wrong, I have no clue. Yeah, okay. I have no clue. For one point, last clue. In 2008, this person entered the Alberta Provincial Legislature uh. as MLA of Calgary Elbow, mm. became Minister of Justice and Attorney General, and ended up becoming Alberta Premier. That's Alison Redford, yes. And now it I is so. Alison Redford. Good for you. Mm. This, I have to say, though, rereading it, it was kind of hard. They were not. Well, if you know clues. any of those things, then, yeah. <laughs> then it would be easy. But if you don't know them, but you still got not it. a lot of clues so there. You still okay. got it. This is really good. All right. I'm very curious to see what the theme is out of this. We've got Leslie Frost and Allison Redford. Okay. They really made it easy for me. Third person. Well, the thing is, you're so good. I have to make challenges, uh -huh. challenging quiz. So wait, I have three points, right? You have three points. I mean, if you I have, if, get... you, if you get five points, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an honorable All mention. Right. So here. I need to get at least three points. Okay. Okay. I will try for three. This person was born in Saint Agathe des Monts in the Laurentians in 1916. He studied law at the University of Ottawa and Université de Montréal. And he entered provincial politics in 1948 as the MLA of Missisquoi. Hmm. Uh, this rings a bell, Saint Agathe des Monts. 1948. Um, hmm. Jean Lesage. No, nope, not Jean Lesage. Okay, uh -huh. free guess is spent. Second clue. He served as Minister of Forests and Hydraulic Resources under the Duplessis and Sauvé government. After, after the Union Nationale was defeated in 1960, he tried to become Union Nationale leader in 61, but he lost to Daniel Johnson Sr. Oh my goodness. Who did you don't Johnson know the details of the 61? leadership race of the Union Nationale in 61? I haven't gotten to that one yet. Uh... <laughs> Oh, uh, who would have run for the Union Nationale? I feel like this is going to be either 
kind of tough or, or kind of easy once I, once I hear it. Um, Let me go on. Oh, this is killing me. Yeah. Yeah, it looks painful, I have to say. Yeah. I look at you right now, it looks painful. Oh, no, keep going. I can't All get right. my three points. It, if you have two, it'll be an honorable uh, mention. Thank you. His son served in the René Lévesque cabinet. His wife was elected federal MP of Brom, Missisquoi in the 1984 election and was re-elected in 1988. She was part of the Moroni cabinet. Mm. Oh, did, did, did I make this quiz too tough? It's this one. This one's really tough. <laughs> yeah, I apologize. Uh, no, I got nothing. I okay. got nothing. This person, this person became deputy premier of Quebec, then premier of Quebec after Daniel Johnson passed away in office. Oh. Uh, oh, who replaced him? Um, Jean-Jacques Bertrand, wasn't it? Jean-Jacques Bertrand is the right answer. You got all, you got all three. You're just lacking in the points, but this is okay. This was this was really tough. Eric, good. This was good tough, job. and this you know what? I still tough. got all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> this was tough, yeah. Uh, but can you imagine though the the, the family uh, discussions? This guy, Union Nationale. His uh, son served in the René Lévesque cabinet. His wife was a federal conservative, pro progressive conservative. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, interesting family. And Bertrand uh, has a, a, a writing, a name after him in the Laurentians. So, a writing of Bertrand. Hmm. So, anyway. What do you got to do to get yourself a, a writing name? How, when are we going to get a writing, uh, the writing of Fournier? Oh, it's, I, I counted. Where I mean, would it this, be? Where would you want it to be? Well, I mean, they're going to remain no Rosemont after me, right? No, it's not true. Okay. Uh, no, but uh, I, that, this is going to be another quiz when we get closer to the Quebec election. In the 125 writings, there are 13 premiers that have names, uh, writing mm. names. Uh, I'm going to ask you to guess all 13 at some point, but this is for a oh, future okay. quiz. But good, luck, uh, good job, that. Eric. You still got all three names, and that's pretty good. So a round of applause for Eric. Yeah. All right, number of the week. Oh, um, he's so grumpy right now. <laughs> I'm can't. grumpy. All right, here, let me go first. So my number of the week is 24. This was Kevin Falcons, BC United leader. His approval rating among BC conservative oh, voters. Wow. 53% of BC conservative voters have an unfavorable view of Kevin Falcon. We were talking about whether one of the parties can kind of consolidate the vote. It's going to be really hard for BC United to consolidate that conservative vote. When conservatives kind of dislike him almost as much as they dislike David Eby. So yeah. uh, an extra challenge for BC United. Adopting a shade of blue, probably not going to cut it. Another challenge that adds to the pile, right? Yeah. Uh, my numbers of the week are 29 and 30 percent. Uh, in the Léger poll in Quebec, 29 percent was the satisfaction rating a satisfaction level of the Legault government and 30 was a satisfaction of the Trudeau government. So if you're wondering how much in trouble, how in trouble uh, Monsieur Legault is, he has about the same approval rating as Justin Trudeau in Quebec. So not really good. One of them faces an election a little bit sooner than the other one. So eh, one year away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's a year? <laughs> All right. Well, that'll be it for this episode of The Numbers. As always, you can go to thenumberspod.ca to join our Patreon. We get you early access to the episodes on Thursday, gets you access to our Discord, where you can ask us our questions for the mailbag. And uh, it means you also get our bonus episodes. We'll have an episode next week. That'll just go out to our Patreon members. So you can go to thenumberspod.ca for that. Philip, I'm not going to punish you with a really tough quiz next week. <laughs> I because I don't think that would be fair. I'm going to give you a really easy one, deceptively easy, and maybe you'll fail it, and then that'll be even more embarrassing. I think to to uh, yeah set me up and make me feel overconfident, huh? So okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, I like that. And then writing that. writing results from the 1936 election. So <laughs> <laughs> merci beaucoup, Eric, and thank you everyone for supporting this podcast. We greatly appreciate it. See you next week. <laughs>